Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you today about Cloud Optimized Point Cloud. Uh, I'll probably alternate every pronunciation. Uh, I have kind of a thing where, uh, I, you know, acronym pronunciation in different languages is always kind of different, and I always found that really interesting. And so um, however you want to pronounce it in your language is just fine with me. Um, the lights are up a little high, but uh, how many of you in this audience are doing anything with LiDAR or point cloud content? All right, that's a good set. How many of you have used uh, Poodle or LAS tools or white box tools or LASPy? Most of you as well, okay. So, um, so this is gonna be a friendly audience, I'm excited. <laughs> Uh, my name is Howard Butler. I have a company in Iowa City, like Mike said, called Hobu Inc. Uh, we're a five-person team. Uh, we're an open core company that is focused on LiDAR data, point cloud data management. So if you have a country-sized uh, point cloud and you want to know what the heck to do with it, how do you distribute it, how should it be organized in such a way that people can access and do things with it, uh, come to us. And so we uh, work on the, this COPSI project that I'm talking about today. Um, Entwine, which is a software for organizing point cloud data, and the Poodle project. So one of the realities of point cloud data that's a really important property, I think, for people to think about is it's read many more times than it's written. And so data formats and organization should really be tilted toward um, this, this reality. Uh, also, software, uh, many software use point cloud data in kind of a pan and scan sort of search mode. You'll, you're looking for objects. You're uh, filtering data based on a position of another uh, object in space. And so data organization that supports fast searching without lots of overhead is a really important property. Uh, third uh, point, cloud. It, it's fluffy, right? And what I mean by that is uh, a billion point point cloud scan of the Duomo um, taking a point out of it does not materially change uh, the information content of that file or of that data. And uh, data formats that are organized and structured with that reality in mind uh, can do a lot. Uh, the open formats that we have in our ecosystem, LAS, LAZ, E57, have pretty good interop, especially for the geospatial LiDAR domain, but there are closed uh, point cloud formats that can do more. So backing up 15 or 20 years ago, LiDAR um, was, you know, was a kind of a niche technology. Um, governments could do it, it was really expensive, and they were capturing points uh, across their systems at, at uh, quite slow speed. And even then, the files were quite large for, for the time. Um, this is a curve that everybody kind of is used to seeing in, in culture these days, you know, the hockey stick curve. Um, that's really uh, applying to data in geospatial LiDAR scans. Uh, the data volumes, the densities, you know, point per meter, whatever they're, they're using to declare that uh, is rapidly increasing. Um, that corresponds directly to resolution of the scan, right? And everybody wants as much as possible. I mean, all, more is always better, right? But software formats and data organization need to keep up with this challenge. So what is COPSI? So, COPSI is an LAZ 1.4 file. It's backward compatible. Your LAZ, uh, LAZIP library, your LAZPy library that reads LAZ data, your QGIS software that reads LAZ data can read it just as an LAZ file if it wants. But LAZ has a mechanism for storing metadata. And what we're doing is adding metadata to organize, uh, spatially organize that LAZ file and then we're clustering the storage of that, uh, those chunks or that, that data structure into the file itself. What does this allow us? So uh, first, um, like a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, it allows an opt-in spatial access. And what I mean by that is an application that doesn't care about um, having complexity to be able to spatially select or filter the content can just read the file front to back, read the content, and do whatever it wants with it but it does allow selective decompression. So an application that does put in the effort or the capability to figure out where should I actually decompress data uh, can do so in a performant way. And of course, just like Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, this is uh, backward compatible with LAZ. 
Um, we have to thank Martin Eisenberg um, from uh, Rapid Lasso. He had a company called Rapid Lasso uh, who died this past uh, September for uh, developing LazZip in the mid-2000s. He released this as open source uh, in 2011 and 12. Uh, he, of course, was instrumental in our community, instrumental in the ASPRS LAS specification, and had uh, his software LAS tools with his company Rapid Lasso. You know, it's been very influential in, in our community, and uh, you know, very sad to see him uh, uh, pass. But we can take LAZ, add a little bit of uh, essentially metadata to it, and get a lot for it. So why would we choose to do that with LAZ? Um, LAZ kind of has industry-wide uh, read support, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, software that's doing geospatial LIDAR or even point clouds would have, that might not be geospatial, has it, LAZ support, certainly on the read side. Uh, it provides an efficient lossless compression of the content. It's open source software, and uh, recently, this past winter, we uh, changed the license from LGPL to Apache, so if uh, embedding the LazZip code base into, uh, say, you're doing um, App Store type de deployment. Um, that's a possibility now without any restriction. And there's JavaScript, C++, and Python and Rust implementations uh, support for it. Downsides of LazZip and LAZ is it can be kind of CPU intensive. Um, it's slowish to compress because it's trying to squeeze as much fluff out of the cloud as it can. Um, it's faster to decompress. Um, it's chunked to allow you to seek across the file and only decompress chunks that you need, and that's the property we're taking advantage of with COPSI. Um, but it has a complex compression model, meaning uh, it, it was organized and developed in support of storing what's called linear mode pulsed LIDAR, you know, a typical LIDAR laser scan. And that supposes a, a, a data organization and a compression model. And not all LIDAR, and certainly not all geospatial point cloud data say you were doing point cloud from uh, coincident match imagery, fits that model particularly well. But it still does okay, and the interoperability is still worth it. So, you know, there's a Sullivan quote, a famous architect, uh, that, that form follows function, right? So LAZ certainly follows its function, which is to provide a lossless, compressed organization of ASPRS, LAS data. So, you know, software engineers like to solve problems that they can't solve. And, uh, you know, the, this, we've always had this kind of back and forth with my engineering team of what, what's the ideal point cloud format? <laughs> and, and, you know, everybody starts putting up their list of features that they might want. And many of these features are in, in competition or completely opposed to each other. And, and so there is no right format. Um, and, you know, what we can, you know, that doesn't exist. And what we can hope to do is avoid this, though, which is creating another one. Um, and so that's what we're doing with COPSI, right? It's backward compatible with LAZ. It's just an uh, augmentation or an extension of, of LAZ for applications that want to opt into it. So if we take our laundry list of uh, features that we wanted and knock off a few that are probably in opposition with what we're doing with LazZip, uh, we can get uh, a quite a large list. For LAZ, the features that are missing, um, and certainly in comparison to uh, commercial f uh, formats that might be available is the ability to select uh, spatially for data that you want and the ability to select for resolution and to do those in combination. And so the organization of a COPSI file, uh, what it's doing is allowing applications, if they choose to, to opt in to be able to, to do that part of the challenge. So spatial access, meaning a windowing sort of operation, whether it's a 2D or 3D window, and then resolution, where the data are decimated into a period, uh, pyramid. And so typically in point cloud data, you have two kinds of indexing structures. One is called an octree, tree, and the other might be a KD tree. And for, for Copsy's case, we're doing an octree. tree. Another important uh, property that uh, Copsy um, supports because of its organization is the concept of HTTP partial access, right? So an application reaching out over the, the network, over HTTP, can, can hop and skip around a file to select and fetch only the bytes it might want to. Uh, what this allows is applications to control how they traverse across that file, how they might operate in parallel if you had multiple processes filtering or, or selecting that data, 
and how they might do so uh, according to whatever volume they can manage at a point in time. So instead of data as a service, uh, Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF and Cloud Optimized Point Cloud are data is a service, right? Just at rest sitting on an HTTP server, an application can consume it as a service if it chooses to, or it could simply download all the content, process it front to, ba front to back. This is a concept that's really important in uh, kind of an emerging uh, organizational framework called Cloud Native Geospatial. Uh, you know, Matt Hansen and the crew had a, a very packed stash session this morning about Stack. Hopefully some of you saw it. Uh, COPSI certainly is trying to be well aligned with, with that approach, being able to partially access content if you desire, applications that can control how they filter and process data, and being able to do that in parallel uh, you know, with many workers or many applications, many uh, processes touching it at once. Why do we want to augment LAZ? So LAZ right now is, is, is the storage and transmission format of record for most of the public LIDAR. Uh, if you go to a, uh, an agency's website to down, download LIDAR for your country, you know, nine and a half out of 10 times, it's gonna be LAZ tiles that you're fetching. There's petabytes of LAZ content out there. And it's well established, it's widely implemented, there's open source software for it, um, it's based on the LAS spe specification, and we want this cloud optimized GeoTIFF property of opt-in uh, spatially accelerated access, um, but let's do that for point clouds. How does it do it? Um, so there's a octree metadata, um, on this particular uh, picture down below, it's the, the, the blue box out on the right, and that tells an application if it seeks to it and consumes it, here's how I might manipulate or move around in that, um, in the gray box where the points are. And applications can, can control uh, which chunks they might read for which resolutions, and an application can figure out what data it needs to select without over-reading, over-decompressing, or, or consuming lots of network bandwidth. LA, uh, COPSI only supports the point data records six, seven, and eight, which are kind of the common sweet spot for LAS uh, archives, right? So most point cloud data, it's not waveform data, it's just geospatial point cloud data. It also supports extra bytes, which you know, some of the uh, agencies are starting to provide it as content. So what? So you have this data format. Everyone has a data format. What can you do with this thing? So one of the things we developed uh, is a browser-based web application, uh, this, this particular thing is not open source, but uh, others are, are available that you could do so. Um, being able to decompress, filter, select, and put this data in a web browser, uh, in this case it's using cesium. So this is a, a, you know, a substantial, I think it's 330 megabyte file, uh, you know, just browsing, manipulating, filtering through the content, and providing it to a browser-based application for people to visualize it. This application's available at viewer.copsy.io. If you have a Copsy file, because maybe you converted it using QGIS, recently released QGIS from the Lucha team in our crowdfunding effort, uh, you can actually drag and drop it from your desktop and load it locally in this viewer if you wanted to. So that's a, a thing we just released for it. So what? So what else can you do with a Copsy file? Um, because of the, the resolution and the windowing selectivity, it makes it easy for applications to control how much data they're going to select. So this uh, 330 megabyte file, um, say I want a two meter overview of, in this case, it's the intensity of the, that point cloud that we were looking at in the movie. Um, I only need to, to download uh, 1.7 million of those points um, as opposed to all 360 million of those if I, if I want to satisfy the data at a two meter resolution. And as an application, I can control how I might do that by changing my window. Say I would slide a, 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 a bounds limiting window across the data. Maybe I would uh, change a, a resolution. I could do that in parallel. I could do that over HTTP. I could do that over a local file system. So I, as an application consumer of this content, I have a lot of control about how I uh, attack it with computing. So what? Uh, this, the bottom uh, uh, bullet's out of date here. QGIS 3.2.6, which was 
3.26, which was released in June, I think we're at 3.262 right now, supports COPSI as its uh, internal format. And so if you drag an uh, LAZ file or an LAS file onto QGIS, it'll process it into a COPSI file for you and start to display and allow you to do fantastic GIS uh, 3D visualization. It'll allow you to do 2D GIS if you want with it. There's more features coming out from the Lutra team. And, uh, you know, uh, make sure to catch uh, Martin DeBias' talk uh, tomorrow afternoon. So the, this uh, particular movie, we're uh, navigating a, a scene in, I think it's Melbourne, Australia. It's like a, I don't remember, 10 gigabyte file or something like this. So over the internet, you know, really large file organized as one data structure, an application, um, you know, it's using... Uh, uh, Frustum and camera query to figure out where am I located, what data do I need to select, dereferencing that metadata, selecting those points, filtering and pulling it into the browser. So what? Okay, I can make pretty pictures, pretty movies, I can filter data uh, for a little preview image, so what? Uh, we worked uh, with Microsoft Planetary Computer to provide all of the USGS uh, LiDAR point cloud content in a, a stack catalog uh, and organized as cloud optimized point cloud files. So if you're using planetary computer and you're doing US based um, data processing, if you wanted to touch any one of those tiles, ask questions of it, filter and construct data. Uh, in this case, I was uh, generating a height above ground surface for uh, the park in, in central Chicago. Uh, using There's a uh, Jupyter notebook you can go visit. Um, asking the, the stack API that's available, hey, which tiles would I select for this particular window or whatever the filter I would use to select stack. Filtering that data with Poodle for height above ground, maybe I would buffer it out, maybe I would control how that algorithm is working. And uh, in this case, we're just producing a little image. Um, if you want to find out more about Poodle and uh, kind of what the state of things is, make sure you see Mike Smith's talk tomorrow afternoon. Uh, his, he'll be given a, a kind of a state of poodle um, upstairs, I think. So what else can you do with Copsy? And, and this, in my opinion, is the most important thing about cloud-optimized GeoTIFF and why cloud-optimized GeoTIFF has been such a successful thing in our industry is it's just an LAZ file or it's just a TIFF file, right? So applications do not have to add special support to read the LAZ content out of a Copsy file. And that's a really important property to allow applications a, a smooth ramp to adding support instead of a big discontinuous cliff. They can add support for it at their leisure. And it allows the rest of the, the ecosystem to build out data archive, data management, data storage um, for however they might uh, manage the content. Uh, we had been working on something called Entwined Point Tile recently, uh, maybe the last few years. If you're following Phosphor G, you would have seen Connor Manning talk about EPT. One of the challenges with Entwined Point Tile is, in, in concept, it's the same thing as Cloud Optimized Point Cloud. It's chunks of Octree. Um, the problem is they're exploded across a file system or an object store. And if you never have to move that data, that's not really a problem. Say you're in Amazon or Google Cloud, you don't move content from S3 or GCS. But if you're not, say you're at desktop scale on, on a laptop doing QGIS, you don't want a million files, right? That's a really big problem for you. The other thing that doesn't, isn't so great about exploded object stores, ex exploded data structures, let's say, is they don't fit the concepts of stack collection and stack item particularly well because conceptually they're a stack item, but they're actually lots of little objects. And so um, it, it makes it a little bit more challenging. So, Something like this makes it more convenient and easy, and it allows uh, people to control how big their tiles are. Maybe we process data at such and such a t tile resolution and tile size, and, and they get to control that. So our roadmap, uh, in 20, uh, November of 2021, we finalized the specification. Uh, Poodle 2.4.0 was released uh, this past March. I think we're up to 2.4.3. Um, uh, has both readers and writers .copic, so you can, or copy, so you can filter, con construct that data, read that data, do whatever you need to with it. Um, and Safe FME has it on their roadmap. QGIS, of course, has support for it. Open Drone Map just added support for it, so you can export a copy file. Uh, Python LASPy library has it, and so on. Take homes for today. Uh, you know, if you go back and want to uh, think 
think about this or how to use it. Lots of open source, no official pronunciation. And I have uh, party favors if you ask a question. So uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>